Welcome. Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's Premier's Citizens Forum. We're delighted that you're with us today. I'm Don Williams, President of City Club. Our program today is entitled Rediscovering the Private Sphere. Our speaker is Dr. Robert Berdahl, President of the Association of American Universities. On behalf of our television and radio audiences, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. First, a few announcements. After a month off in August, we have a full schedule of great Friday programs this fall. The club also has a very active research schedule with several reports slated to be published by the end of the year. Next Friday's forum is entitled a World in Conflict, The Way Out of Iraq. Our speaker will be General Tony McPeak, who's the former Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. He will discuss options to end the war, how to withdraw troops safely and diplomatically, and how to rebuild America's international standing. It's all about food at the City Club in September. In fact, this month could be called the Fall Harvest. Programs will cover what we choose to eat, where our food comes from, and the implications of our choices, both on our families and our communities. The September 21st Friday Forum, now I'm going to give you some evidence of why it should be called the Fall Harvest. Uh, the September 21st Friday Forum is why the Farm Bill Matters from Oregon to Africa with Congressman Earl Blumenauer as our speaker. In three weeks, our program will be Thinking Outside the Booth, Farmers Markets, Public Markets, and Creating More Local Food Choices. But wait, there's more. On Monday, September 24th, the Citizens Read Book Group will discuss the book Animal, Vegetable, and Miracle, and another book simply entitled Plenty. Finally, on Friday, September 28th, the City Club will host an open house with local food and wine at the City Club Commons from 4.30 until 6. The event is free and open to the public, and to reserve a space at any of these events, please contact Kim at the City Club office. Next month, City Club commences a transition. After four years, our wonderful Executive Director, Wendy Rodmacher Willis will be leaving and starting a new job. She will join the staff of Oregon Solutions. It's a program which helps local communities develop solutions to some of the state's most pressing public programs, uh, I'm sorry, problems. It empowers government agencies, businesses, nonprofits, and private citizens to collaborate and to create positive change in their communities. I'm pleased to announce that Wade Fickler the City Club's current policy director, will become the acting executive director. Wade has worked in his position for five years and has an unswerving commitment to the organization. He even started a City Club in the Ukraine in 2001. City Club will hire a temporary project manager to assist Wade during the transition to ensure that our research reports are published on schedule. We will honor Wendy for her contributions at the forum on September 28th and at the open house I mentioned, but let's give her a hand right now. <laughs> Join me in welcoming our new City Club members. They will stand and I'll ask you to hold your applause until all are introduced. First, Kate Lohr, who is the Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Church in downtown Portland. Gary Obermeyer, who is a School Improvement Specialist with Learning Options. Patricia Young, retired. And John Christensen is another new member, referred by the Weisses. Please join me in welcoming them to City Club. We're fortunate to have terrific corporate sponsors for this program, and this quarter's sponsors are Zimmer Gunsel Frasca Architects, 
and Stoll Reeves LLP. I'm going to ask you again, thank, join me in thanking them for their support. Beginning with the GI Bill and continuing with the baby boomer generation, the federal government has provided students and public universities with various forms of federal aid. This funding has been essential to national security and also to economic growth for more than half a century. The partnership between the federal government and our nation's research universities has resulted in extraordinary advances in knowledge. Is that progress now threatened by stagnant federal investment in research? Our speaker today believes there's been a fundamental shift and it's swept across higher education. It's a lack of public support. Is the privatization of higher education being driven by commercial interests or simply by the abdication of the public interest in education? Public education is only one example of the debate. Other traditional areas in the public domain, ranging from construction and maintenance of highways to operation of prisons, are moving to the private sector. Is there a danger in this trend and what are the implications? How do we revive the nation's commitment to the public good rather than an overemphasis on individual self-interest? Our speaker today is an expert on that topic. Dr. Robert Berdahl became president of the Association of American Universities in 2006. His undergraduate degree was earned at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He received his master's degree from the University of Illinois and his PhD at the University of Minnesota. He began his distinguished, and I mean distinguished, academic career in the history department at the University of Massachusetts. Oregon beckoned, and he joined the history department at the University of Oregon two years later. And I will tell you, in fact, under intense cross-examination, he revealed to me that Steve Novak was one of his star students. He did not agree to release Steve's transcripts, so, so we'll have to wait for that. He served as Dean at the College of Arts and Sciences at the U of O from 1981 to 1986. And current University of Oregon President Dave Fronmeyer, who was a young faculty colleague of Dr. Berdahl's at the time. Um, and given Dr. Berdahl's topic today, I'm sure he'd be interested in Fronmeyer's speech to the City Club on June 15th this year. David informed us that Oregon ranked 45th nationally and per student spending at colleges and universities. Dr. Berdahl left Oregon to become Vice Chancellor of, of Academic Affairs at the University of Illinois and then served as President of the University of Texas at Austin for four years. He was then appointed Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley from and served in that position from 1997 until 2004. He quickly acclimated to the culture at Cal Berkeley because during his inauguration there were three demonstrations. And you cannot help but be impressed with his accomplishments while in that position. Since he was born and educated in South Dakota, one of his friends and colleagues on the faculty at Cal nicknamed him the Midwestern hard boy, and I can understand why from looking at his accomplishments. When he assumed the top position at Berkeley, he found the physical infrastructure in tatters and the library had fallen in national rankings. Seven years later, the campus was seismically safe after an $800 million infusion of funding to renovate and upgrade campus facilities. The Cal Library rose to number three behind Harvard and Yale in national rankings. He instituted campus outreach programs for disadvantaged students. And most importantly, after developing a strategic master plan, he left the university with an academic program of which the Cal football team can be proud. <laughs> He's the author of one book, 
and co-author of another book and has written numerous articles about German history. He and his wife, Margaret, live in Lake Oswego and have three married daughters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Berdahl. Well, thank you very much, uh, Don, for that very, very nice introduction. I'm really delighted to be here. I I'm always delighted to be in Oregon, and I will tell you that even though we left Oregon uh, exactly uh, 20 years ago, uh, and then moved, as you heard, to Illinois and Texas and California, uh, after dragging my wife around the country, uh, I said, where would you like most to live when we retire? And she said, I think I'd like to live in Portland. And so we, a few years ago, bought a house uh, near Lake Oswego and, uh, and planned to retire here. I just didn't tell her when I was going to retire. Uh, and so then I was offered this position in Washington, which was too good to, to pass up. And, and I'm living, we're living a kind of bi-coastal existence now between Portland and, and Washington, D.C. But this is home, and I'm delighted to be here. And in a couple of years, when I get out of that position, I, I hope to settle into Portland and become uh, a, an active member of this organization, uh, about which I know too little, but have heard some of the broadcasts when I've been uh, here in, in Portland. So I'm, I'm really very, very pleased to be here and honored and delighted uh, to be a part of this program. Uh, I think next week looks even much more interesting than this week, I have to say. Anybody who's got a solution to get us out of Iraq uh, is worth listening to, uh, far more than anything that I have to say. But as you heard, and you got from Don a very, uh, I think, uh, accurate summary of some of the issues that I want to talk about today, I am an educator. The Association of American Universities, which uh, I have the privilege of leading, represents the 60 U.S. research universities, public and private. So it has uh, all of the leading research universities, of which the University of Oregon is one. Uh, and uh, we work in Washington on behalf of those institutions in support of university-based research. Uh, and the funding of university-based research, primarily uh, by the federal government. But most of my experience, as you heard, indeed all of my experience as a university administrator, was with public universities. And it is about public universities and what I would refer to as the gradual privatization of those public universities that leads me to the topic that I want to talk about today. Uh, and so what I want to begin with is a discussion of, of that process uh, and then to look more broadly at the decline of the public sphere as I define it and what that may mean for American democratic uh, society. It is not a phenomenon that is specific to universities but I think a broad cultural change of which public universities are a part and, and I think to the detriment of these universities and to the society as a whole. Let me begin with a true story. One of my colleagues, who I won't name, was president of a distinguished public university, was meeting with a newly appointed trustee of that university. The trustee, knowing that my colleague had been at Harvard be before becoming president of uh, that institution, asked how that institution differed from Harvard. Well, the primary difference, my colleague said, of course, is that Harvard is private. Uh, the trustee looked a bit amazed and he said, Harvard is private? Uh, why, yes, of course, replied my colleague, a bit amazed himself at the question. Well, who owns it, replied the trustee. Aside from the obvious uh, ignorance about higher education in America, which such a question may reveal about some members of our governing boards, 
the comment, who owns Harvard or who owns the university, is one that numerous critics of higher education have been asking. And the answer is maybe not so clear. Much of the criticism that has been recently concentrated on universities has concentrated on the gradual commercialization of universities. Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, has written a book, Universities in the Marketplace, The Commercialization of Higher Education. There's a book by a Berkeley faculty member named David Kerp entitled Shakespeare, Einstein, and the Bottom Line, The Marketing of Higher Education. Other critiques, less reliable in fact and in tone, have also appeared. The critique of corporate influences and corporate models for universities is not new in this country, of course. Thorsten Veblen voiced such criticism early in the last century, and they have been recurrent for a very, very long time. Indeed, the famous free speech movement at Berkeley, which may be seen as the beginning of the student protest of the 1960s, was framed in part in protest to the president of the University of California, Clark Kerr's concept of the multiversity, the large, complex research university that he defined so well in his book entitled The Uses of the University. The spokesman of that free speech movement, those of you who remember that movement in the 60s, was Mario Savio, whose brilliant oratory called out to his fellow protesters against what he saw as the corporate model for the university, and he fully exploited that corporate multi uh, metaphor when he addressed the students. He said, now I'll ask you to consider if this is a firm and if the board of regents or the board of directors and if President Kerr is the manager, then I'll tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees and we're the raw material but we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be made into a product, that don't mean to be bought by some clients of the university, be they government, be they industry, be they organized labor. There is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you have to put your bodies on the gears and upon the wheels and the levers and make the whole apparatus stop. Well, those are powerful words of criticism and resistance that came from student activists against the organization of the university as early as the 1960s. And they're no, now so much a part of Berkeley's history and lore that they are inscribed on the walls of what we called the Free Speech Cafe that is located now in the undergraduate library of the university. Corporate a commentary about the corporate influences and the commercialization of universities thus is not new. In one fundamental sense, American universities have always been linked closely to commercial development of their society. The very notion of the land-grant university which shaped American public higher education since the 19th century has always intended to give agricultural and industrial foundations in this country an educational component. I would submit, however, that what we are experiencing today is something new. That what I'm referring to here as the privatization of public universities constitutes a new development, one which is part of a broader transformation of our cultural values that has been underway for the last quarter century. When I speak of the privatization of public universities, I'm referring to three phenomena in particular. One is the increasing commercialization of university-based research. Since the passage of the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980, which permitted universities to patent uh, federally sponsored research, the number of university patents has increased substantially. And as the American economy is driven increasingly by high technology, uh, university-oriented or derived intellectual property has become a major force in economic development, and the partnership between universities and high-tech companies is ever more refined. Indeed, many of the new companies founded 
have been founded by university faculty from research universities. To cite only the California example, two-thirds of the biotech companies in the, in the country are in California. And it is no surprise, therefore, that two-thirds of those biotech companies in California are located within a few miles of one of the campuses, and most were founded by faculty members. Berkeley has recently negotiated a $500 million deal with British Petroleum to develop alternative fuels. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with this. And I believe that in the importance of university research in furthering economic development, but it can introduce fundamental conflicts of interest, and it can undermine the role of basic research, turning that research in a much more applied direction uh, and in directions which are not defined necessarily by the researchers themselves. The second phenomenon that characterizes the privatization of public universities is the fact that a declining percentage of their instructional resources comes from public sources. Many public university presidents and chancellors grappling with the declining support from their states have used the term privatization to describe what is happening. And reviewing the percentage of state funds comprising the budgets of some public flagship universities reveals some staggering statistics. 8% of the budget of the University of, California, uh, University of Virginia comes from the state of Virginia. 18% of the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, less than 25% of the University of Illinois, and I think the University of Oregon is somewhere in the low 20s uh, as well. Catherine Lyle, the former president of the University of Wisconsin, has said, quote, America is rapidly privatizing its public colleges and universities whose mission used to be to serve the public good. But if private donors and corporations are providing much of the university's budget, then they will set the agenda, perhaps in ways the public likes, perhaps not. Public control is slipping away. Private philanthropy is important. And we raised a billion and a half when I was president or chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and I note uh, the enormous generosity that Phil Knight has given to the University uh, of Oregon. And it's important and it's welcome, but it should not and cannot ultimately replace the public dollars that are essential, I think, to maintaining the public trust of these universities. The third phenomenon is the development of commercial for-profit educational enterprises, the largest and the best known of which is the University of Phoenix, the fastest growing segment of higher education in the United States is the for-profit, with a number of universities now listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, and dozens of for-profit educational enterprises that have arisen marketing courses via the internet all around the globe. Many of these are, as I said, are listed in the stock exchanges and in the face of the call for increased technological education around the globe, these enterprises are moving into specialized markets everywhere. They meet an important need, especially for adult learning, especially for re-education and education in the developing world, for technical education in countries that do not have well-developed educational systems of higher education, and even in the United States for adult learners who are in, in the workplaces. But there are limitations to what these universities can and cannot do. Uh, and, for example, they, none of these universities have regular faculty members. None of these universities have research components. Uh, and if we move in a direction of for-profit institutions dominating the educational landscape, we will lose an enormous amount of the potential that now exists uh, within our uh, universities. 
A recent book edited by Douglas Priest and Edward St. John entitled The Privatization of Public Universities documents the manner in which the state and federal governments have reduced their support for public institutions. Uh, and this loss has been met by increased reliance upon philanthropy, tuition, and commercial activities. This morning's Oregonian, I noted, has an article about the infusion of new state money into the Oregon system of higher education. But it also points out how far behind that system continues to lag. Although it does not use the term privatization, the report of the National Commission on the Future of Higher Education, recently published, appointed by Secretary Spellings, paints a rather discouraging picture of the future of public support for universities. Predicting that government support for public education will not increase substantially in the years ahead, and criticizing universities for tu tuition increases that exceed the, the overall uh, increases in the uh, cost of living or the median income, this report uh, suggests that in universities will have to continue to live with less public support even than they've had in the past. Whether or not one chooses to use the term privatization to describe the process that has altered the balance of funding of public universities, everyone, I think, can agree on one central fact, and that is that public universities derive a much higher percentage of their revenue today from tuition and fees paid by students than in the, than in the past. In this sense, private individuals rather than the public as a whole provide a larger share of the cost of education. This represents a fundamental change in the social contract between the public and higher education. Throughout most of its history, public higher education has been viewed as a public good. Investment in public higher education was justified on the grounds that society as a whole benefited from the investment. This was the basis for the modest tuition charges and relatively generous state support in most of our states. It was the rationale for the GI Bill after World War II and for the huge expansion of universities in the 1960s. Beginning in the late 1970s and especially in the 1980s, this began to change. And now the chief beneficiaries of the investment in public higher education were seen to be the individuals receiving the education, attending the universities, rather than society itself. Many factors contributed to this, but the consequence of this shift of attitude was to pass much of higher education's cost from the public to the individual. Just a few figures. In constant dollars, the public college and university revenues per student increased slightly from 1980 to 2003, from 6,500 in 1980 to 7,300 in 2003, an increase of 11% in constant dollars. But the individual share of those revenues increased 173% from 1,700 or nearly $1,800 to $4,800. Put another way, the average student at a public institution paid 27% of the cost of his or her education in 1980 and 66% of that cost in 2003. At the same time, there has been a dramatic shift in financial aid programs, especially in the declining percentage of financial aid that is forthcoming from grants and the increasing percentage that is derived from loans. Loans constitute the largest portion of most financial aid packages, shifting the burden again to the individual student. This is what I mean by the shrinking of the public sphere 
especially as it pertains to the provision of public higher education. It is a fundamental aspect, it seems to me, with, uh, related to this process of privatization. But I do not think that this process of privatization describes only the closer relationship between universities and private industry or changes in the sources of revenue. I'm suggesting that we are experiencing what we are experiencing within public higher education today is a consequence of the shrinking public sphere more generally. And this, this shrinking of the public sphere has profound implications not only for higher education, but for American society and American democracy more generally. When I speak of the public sphere, I'm referring really to three things. First, the public sphere is the realm of public discourse, the arena in which is conducted an open and free discussion about what constitutes the public good. This is how the public sphere was defined in its classical formation by Hannah Arendt, who saw it as emerging in Athenian democracy, finding expression in the Roman Republic and then disappearing in the Middle Ages. It is also how it was defined by Jürgen Habermas, who saw it emerging with bourgeois society in the 18th century. It relies on an open society, a community of free individuals committed to achieving the public interest. America was blessed with the gift of history. Its foundation was laid in the 18th century at precisely the moment that the awareness of a public sphere emerged. And while we are a nation of strong individuals and strong individualism, and that's one of the perhaps salient characteristics of American society, there was as well among the founders of our republic an amazing commitment to the public interest, an amazing sense of civic responsibility based upon the notion that we were, subject, we were citizens and not subjects. So the first meaning of the public sphere is this meaning of the open society, as it were. The second meaning that I would give to the public sphere as I'm using it here has to do with the goods that we create as a society. I've mentioned the schools and colleges and universities, but also extends to security, the police, uh, the military, the prisons, health care. It comprises those things that we create together in a complex, civilized society as a means of looking out for each other. Many of these public goods are a consequence of government action. Many are a consequence of nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations. The third component of the public sphere, as I conceive of it, and I'll only mention it here because I really don't have time to discuss it, is the commons. Those things that we have and share together as a function of being human beings on this planet our environment, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the seas that surround us. Now the interdependence of these three components, it seems to me, is obvious. Without a vital and a genuine discourse about what constitutes the public interest, the other aspects of the public sphere, public goods, and the commons will suffer. Conversely, without the existence of public goods, or with the disappearance of those things that we hold in common, we are not bound together by public interests that provide the foundation for meaningful discourse in a civilized and democratic society. The vitality of democracy and the vitality of the public sphere are inextricably interlinked. My thesis here is that each of these aspects of the public sphere is being circumscribed diminished or eliminated. And it seems to me that we need to understand that process and the intersection of these various aspects of the public sphere if we are to promote and to protect them. 
Let me make a couple of observations, and I'm going to have to cut some of this short because we are, are short of time, and I want to leave time for discussion. But the public sphere as understood as the realm of a public encounter, a realm in which individuals come together and consider the public good, is, I think, absolutely fundamental. And it is improper to introduce into that public sphere the norms that are derived from the private sphere. For example, while loyalty to family and friends is a value in the private sphere of the family or of kinfolk, it is inappropriate in the public sphere. We object to public officials providing favors to their families and friends, for example. It's why no bid contracts are suspect. It is why nepotism is viewed with suspicion. They violate the rules governing the public sphere by introducing private values. The rule of privacy, of discourse, or secrecy, if you will, that is appropriate in protected familial circumstances is inappropriate and corrupting to the public sphere. To the extent that secrecy shrouds considerations of the public's interest, the public sphere is diminished. Likewise, the imposition of market values can corrupt the public sphere. The market is a means of exchanging goods and services for some form of currency. The market presumably operates with free and open competition in doing so, but the public sphere is not a market. The public interest is not to be bought or sold. Justice should not be available only to those with money, nor should the definitions of the public good. The votes of representatives elected to serve the public should not be for sale, and to the extent that votes or government policies or justice or the public interest is bought or sold by private interests, the public sphere itself is diminished. Similarly, we feel uneasy at the revelation that admission to universities may be contingent on philanthropic gifts to a university. The idea that merit should be overridden by someone buying their admission to a university leaves us feeling a bit unclean. The public sphere is dependent upon trust. It is dependent upon people having confidence in the institutions that represent them. If no one listens, what is the point of discourse? If the purpose of discourse is to score political points, to develop wedge issues, debate is debased, and the public sphere is eroded. Now, as must be obvious, I consider the preservation of this public sphere extraordinarily important. It is what binds us together as a community. And the complexity of the social and economic and international issues that confront us is daunting, making reasoned public discourse and discussion of them difficult. As a consequence, participation in self-government, the hallmark of a free and open society and vital to the public sphere, judged at least by voter participation and familiarity with the issues, has declined. Increasingly, government seeks to shroud many of its decisions in secrecy, ostensibly on grounds of national security, effectively removing them from public scrutiny. Market considerations have invaded the political arena to an unprecedented degree, with the cost of running for public office giving advantages to private interests. Legislation is drafted by lobbyists representing special interests and made into law by Congress dependent upon money provided by special interests. When money talks, it is difficult for anyone else to be heard. At the same time, public goods, the second aspect of the public sphere as I've defined it, have become, as I've suggested, increasingly privatized. The end of socialism and the global extension of capitalism have made triumphant an economic ideology that worships the market. Neoliberal economic theory considers government generally to be an efficient provider of goods and services 
and argues that the market is the proper mechanism for providing for all human needs. In its extreme expressions, it borders on anarchism, as in the case of Grover Norquist, a libertarian who famously insisted that he wanted to shrink government until it could be drowned in a bathtub. There are many manifestations of the shrinking public sphere besides the rise of the political system in which money dominates, the, has such a dominant role. One assumption of an effective public sphere is not only a degree of equal access, but it is a degree of shared responsibility and shared sacrifice. Uh, for example, uh, since the beginning of this current war, uh, we have not, I think as a society, uh, experienced much in the way of, of shared sacrifice. And just to give you one statistic, in Princeton's graduating class of 1956, a peacetime graduating class, 450 out of 750 graduates served in the military. In 2004, only three. Public security has been privatized as well. The United States has nearly 100,000 private military contractors in Iraq, making these contractors the second largest member of the coalition of the willing. Domestically, private security is one of the fastest growing industries. We speak, we, we spend 73% more on private security in the United States than on public security. There are three times as many persons employed in private security in the United States as in public security. Private firms run prisons in 13 states. Observing this phenomenon, P.W. Singer, who write, has written extensively about the privatized military, has concluded, quote, the ultimate outcome is that government is no longer the preferred or even the default solution for public concerns. Although some argue that the trend toward privatization is part of a more generalized social fragmentation, he writes, the move is better described as a normative shift in worldview. It is this normative shift of values that I've tried to call attention to here today. Are there any solutions? Is it possible to rebuild this public sphere? What can we do? What kind of public philosophy is called for? Let me list just a few things that it seems to me are a part of that. First, a vigorous and extensive public domain is fundamental to civilized society, to crucially important forms of human flourishing, and to democratic citizenship. Second, belief in the possibility of a public interest distinct from private interest is fundamental to the public domain. The public interest is more than a collection of private interests. Third, the public domain is in a special sense a domain of public trust. Truth-telling is essential to trust and a prerequisite for reasoned public discourse in democratic institutions. Fourth, while the market is an effective means of achieving some forms of accountability, it is not and should not be seen as the primary means of allocating resources in the public needs. In the public sphere, citizens are equal. In the market, they are unequal. The goods of the public, do, fourth, the goods, the goods of the public domain should not be treated as commodities or surrogate commodities. And finally, secrecy in the conduct of public affairs is inimical to democracy and to the preservation of this public sphere. It should be tolerated only when public disclosure presents a clear and present danger to the national interest. It is my hope that we can begin to rebuild an appreciation for public, the public sphere, for the public goods, for the commons, vigorous and reasoned deliberations about the public interest among citizens 
possessed by a strong sense of civic responsibility is essential. The restoration of our investment and commitment in the goods that we rely on as a community is essential. And concern for the commons that constitute our inheritance and must be preserved for our children and grandchildren are essential to the preservation of this public good. Thank you. Asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership. And today we have an additional element of excitement to our question and answer period. City Club is in the final production stage of our 2007 annual report, and Kenneth Ahrens will be taking some photos of today's question and answer period. We want you to know that if you ask a question, you will be photographed. Now, if you're running for public office, you're probably glad about that. If you're not and you have some concerns about having your picture used in our annual report, you should talk to Mark Moscato, our communications coordinator. Ken, we'd also like to thank you for your service to City Club. Of course, having your pictures taken does not exempt you from our 30-second limitation on questions. Our first question today will be asked by our board host, Carla Kelly. Among her responsibilities on the City Club board is chairing the program committee, and she and her committee do a great job of uh, producing 44 Friday forums each year. Carla is general counsel of the Port of Portland. And given today's emphasis on education, it's also appropriate that she asked the first question because after received, she received her first, um, her undergraduate degree, she received a master's degree in English literature and drama at, and was a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin and completed her education with a law degree at Northwestern School of Law. Carla? Thank you very much for that provocative talk, Dr. Birdall. I I'm really glad to hear that you're settle, settling in Portland and living here and hopefully will uh, be joining City Club when you take up permanent residence here. Um, I was re really debating which way to go on questions for you because I'd love to know what you think about the state of education here in Oregon, but your comments um, on the privatization of uh, research really make me think about the dangers on the other side and so I'm going to ask you about that as well. Um, we know that there is a lot of danger in the privatization of research um, and all of the money coming from private interests, but at least we can identify those interests. Those of us outside the academic community just hear hints and rumors, and I don't think I've seen too much on this, but I wonder if you could comment on what has happened in, with the politicization of research money uh, coming from the federal level over the last six years of this administration. Uh, word slips out every once in a while from people you talk to who have applied for grants, who believe that they were denied funding for political reasons, and how do we, how do we uh, address that side of the issue on the political side as well as uh, on the money on the private side where we can at least uh, be certain as to what the interest was. Uh, well, thank you, Carla. That, that's a, a very uh, good and important question. Um, and I would have to say that there is really several ways in which politics influence research. One has to do with policy. Uh, and here one would find, for example, the, the cases that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that is the, uh, the ban, for example, on stem cell lines that are used uh, for research that was imposed by the president, and that has had I think a, a, a very unfortunate impact on research in part because it has limited the federal government's investment in stem cell research, which has many promising possibilities about it. But secondly, it has inspired the states, for example, California, to create large stem cell 
funds for research themselves, and this has been copied all across the United States. And it, it, that has the unfortunate impact of, of creating a state competition for those dollars. Uh, but, but we don't have a national competition for those dollars. Research flourishes in a competitive environment. And for the most part, virtually all of the research money that goes into the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health or the Department of Energy, those large funders of research is done on a competitive peer-reviewed grant basis. Uh, so that applicants from all across the United States apply. Now, if you conduct stem cell research on a state-by-state -state basis, it means that you are limiting uh, to those who are involved in that research within those states the range of competition. And I think that's unfortunate. It, it is, uh, I think, a, a step backward from having the competition that leads to the most outstanding research. The second way in which politics uh, affects uh, research is through earmarks. Uh, congressional earmarks have uh, increased about sixfold in the last 10 years. Uh, billions and billions of dollars are earmarked. Much of it is earmarked for various projects by congressmen, for projects in their districts. Uh, and this comes out of the research budget that agencies have generally. And it means that we have uh, thus less money available for genuinely competitive peer-reviewed projects. It is not clear that the political decision makers uh, are in the best position to decide which research or which research centers are going to conduct the best research in the United States. And in the, in, in the growth of that earmarking, we have seen, it seems to me, uh, a, a political impact on the research directions in the United States that I consider quite adverse. Let's go over here. Ray Plot is a City Club member. <clears throat> I wholeheartedly agree with you. Money has a price. Money dictates policy and controls direction and restricts freedom, ultimately. Let me give you an example and ask for your reaction. Private railroads in our country do not properly serve the public interest. Would you comment, please? I, 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 you'd have to, what, what was it that you said didn't serve the public interest? I'm having trouble hearing. I said that private railroads in our country do not represent the public interest. Private railroads do not serve the public interest, yeah. do you say? Um, well, we, we have never really had national railroads, although there's basically nothing that is, no, no railroad is completely private in the sense that in the 19th century, they're, they're all beneficiaries of tremendous public investment. All of those government lands that were given to the railroads to construct uh, transcontinental railroads was, was an enormous public investment, if you want to look at it that way. Um, it's obvious that the transportation system of, of the country is a part of the public good. Um, I'm more troubled even today as we see many of the interstate highways, for example, in Indiana, being sold to private foreign companies to be managed uh, rather than to be held as a public trust and so forth. Uh, certainly our investment in the infrastructure of the country has been brought to our attention by uh, some rather recent tragedies, Hurricane Katrina and the construction of the levees in, in uh, New Orleans and the collapse of the bridge in, the, in Minneapolis. Uh, and that Interestingly enough, as you may have, have read, uh, the discussion quickly turned in Minnesota after a great deal of opposition to more public spending in highways and bridges and so forth. Uh, the legislature turned around rather quickly after that, that tragedy. Uh, the fact is, it seems to me, concern for 
the public good and the public interest uh, is going to require uh, much greater investment in the infrastructure of, of the country. Uh, we built uh, a system of interstate highways in this country uh, in, in the 1950s uh, and early 60s. Uh, it was a tremendous public investment undertaken initially by a Republican administration. Uh, so it is certainly something, it seems to me, that uh, has been a part of our history and our tradition and can be recovered again. But I think we should include public investment in, in railroads. Mm -hmm. They are an essential part of a transportation system, of a healthy transportation system of any country. Thank you. Joella Worland, club member. This is a fascinating forum, and I hope that uh, City Club members will have a chance to, to work on and develop some of the ideas that you've given us today. But I want to ask you a very direct informational question about your organization. You mentioned that there are 60 universities, is that correct? But, and you 60 mentioned. 60 universities in, in my association. In your association. Right. But only University of Oregon was mentioned here, and it would seem to me by, as research universities or universities that have significant research components, the Health Sciences University, Oregon State University, and Portland State University would all be included. What is the exclusionary basis for your organization? Thank you. Uh, well, that's an interesting question, and I'm asked that very often by university presidents. Uh, the the uh, Association of American Universities was founded in 1900 by uh, 15 initially public and private universities. There were only three public universities initially that were members of it. University of Michigan, the University of Wisconsin, the University of California. Uh, membership is elected by the membership and it is based on a set of indices that have to do with the production of PhDs, the amount of federally funded research, uh, various measures of the distinction of the faculty, and so forth. It, to be a member, you have to be a comprehensive university. So there are no health centers like the Oregon Health Center or the University of California, San Francisco, uh, which are uh, members of it. So it is limited to comprehensive universities. Because so much agricultural funding is formula driven rather than competitively driven, uh, the agricultural component of a research uh, portfolio is not given the same weight as the competitive grant funding uh, in the research component. So there are institutions like Oregon State for whom agriculture is a large part of the portfolio uh, that end up not, uh, at least as yet, being, uh, being um, elected to membership. Uh, but it is, a, um, uh, it, it is a question that I'm asked very, very frequently uh, when I'm uh, out and about and place, representing in, in places where uh, institutions aren't yet members. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member. I'm curious if you could comment in broad brush strokes about the difference between what we're doing in higher education in this country with what's happening in Europe and Asia. It appears to, that uh, there's a kind of a general turn to the private sector economically in those other parts of the world, but you also get the sense that uh, they're investing a lot more in education, and I'm wondering what the privatization picture looks like elsewhere in the globe compared to us. Well, we remain much more privately oriented than any of the other countries you mentioned, uh, although there is a growth uh, of, of a process of privatization in Europe, uh, still the bulk of funding for those universities uh, comes from public funds and, and from the state. There has been a strenuous effort uh, in, in the new uh, European Union to uh, invest more broadly in universities, uh, to introduce some student fees. Uh, the most important element of the European Union uh, 
move is really to open up admission to universities across Europe to citizens of the EU so that people can go from one country to another in, in a much more open uh, system. I think that will introduce more competitive admissions. It will introduce more competitive processes. Uh, China, of course, is investing heavily in its research universities. Uh, Singapore has invested enormous amounts and so forth. Uh, we still uh, are, are spending a good deal on our universities. I'm not suggesting that we're not, but I think it is our competitive edge. Steve, since you're my former student, I'll quickly give you a chance to ask a question. I see him we'll coming forward here. Steve? Steve Novick, City Club member. Dr. Birdall, polls show that most voters would like greater public investment in a variety of services, but they don't think the government needs more tax revenue to do that because they've been convinced the government currently waits most of their money on welfare, foreign aid, waste, fraud, and abuse. That happens not to be true but it's the general understanding. Is there anything that universities can do to promote better understanding of the real choices and trade-offs involved in more public investment in things like public universities so that we can have a more rational discussion? Well, I, I, obviously we're in the business of education and uh, it, it is our responsibility, it seems to me, to try to educate the public to the kind of issues that, that you've pointed to. Uh, it, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the notion that there is a great deal of waste in government is obviously uh, true. Uh, any enterprise that large is bound to have uh, some waste, but it happens in the private sector as well. Uh, and uh, it's just that it, the, the costs of waste in the private sector are hidden in other ways and passed on to consumers. Uh, in any event, uh, I, I think that the issues that you raise about public awareness uh, and public misinformation about where tax dollars go is, 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 a, is an important and a challenging one. I don't have a real good solution to it other than more education. I think the media could help a great deal if, if, uh, if, if we had a media that was uh, attentive to these issues rather than to celebrity status. Dr. Berdahl told me that Steve asks great questions as an undergraduate, too, so I think it was great that we uh, extended. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berdahl, for a great uh, program, and we're adjourned. Yeah, that was really good. Well, thank you.